I'll show you some of the uh, uh, slides here of a few different things. This one, uh, we've heard about this ocean acidification and how increasing CO2 is going to wipe out the reefs. Well, the purple colors are your, your most acid, but it, it's really not acid. It's lower alkalinity. But these areas off the west coast of South America, that's some of the richest fishing areas in the world. And you see a bit of it along the Caribbean coast of Central America. Those are the best developed coral reefs in the, uh, in the tropical Atlantic. Now we come over on uh, our side of things. That yellow around the Australian, uh, around the Barrier Reef Coast, and you see the green up there around Indonesia and Papua New Guinea. Now, they're claiming that there will be a, a tenth of a, of a pH unit decline over the next hundred years if we don't do something, and this is going to wipe out the Barrier Reef. Well, if you look up there around that green around Indonesia and Papua New Guinea, that's what it would be on the Barrier Reef a uh, hundred years from now. And those are considered, that area of eastern uh, uh, Indonesia and Papua New Guinea is considered, the, is called the Coral Triangle, and it's considered to be the richest coral reef region in the world with more species of fish and corals and things than anywhere else. So maybe we have some benefits to look forward to. It's certainly not going to wipe out the reef. Now, the white line around Australia is our exclusive fishing zone. It's the third largest in the world, and it's only slightly smaller than the two biggest, and by far the largest per capita in the world. Now, that blue line up there, that's the fishing area of uh, Thailand, and the yellow roughly outlines Thailand. Uh, they have a tenth of the shelf area we do, a twentieth of the fishing area. They produce 11 times more wild caught production than we do, and 30 times more aquaculture production, uh, and 250 times greater harvest rate. Now, we're importing three quarters of the seafood we eat uh, because we've ran our fishermen out of business, and Thailand's the biggest supplier. Now, when I pointed some of these things out, our ridiculously low rate of harvest, the Greens came up with the idea that, well, the reason we can't harvest much is because our waters are so poor. Well, this is a global map of ocean productivity from satellite monitoring of the chlorophyll content in water. And you see the blue is lower productivity, the uh, turquoise there. Is, uh, is moderate, and then in the green is, is higher. Well, you see ours is actually about like Thailand, if we look there, and it's similar, say, our southern waters and our waters up off the uh, uh, northwest shelf are pretty similar to around New Zealand. Incidentally, New Zealand, with about a quarter of the uh, EEZ fishing area we have, their total production is twice what we do, so they're, uh, they're about eight times greater production of fish than we do. Here's some global figures on fishery production for different countries. Our uh, catch rate, our total catch, is about like Finland, Germany, and Poland, and about half that of Italy. These are wild-caught fishery uh, harvest rates in kilograms per uh, square kilometer of EEZ zone. And you see the production in, uh, in Thailand over there on the left. And ours, you can barely see it. It's about one pixel wide, a bit less than Israel or Papua New Guinea. Here's uh, some global aquaculture uh, figures. Again, our production is minuscule. Here in Queensland, where we have some of the best conditions in the world for it, we haven't had a new application for aquaculture in a decade now because the regulations just make it uh, impossible to operate. These are uh, catch rates per square kilometer on various coral reef areas around the Pacific. And the barrier reef is the second one up there at the top. There's nothing there. The reason is 
is because our catch rate is so small, it's less than one pixel wide on the image, so you can't see it. I pointed out 90% of the barrier reef is rarely ever visited by anyone, and less than 10% of the reefs are regularly used for tourism and fishing. Now, that's just cyclone tracks across the reef from 1969 to 97. So you see every one of those represents tens of thousands of hectares, in some, some cases hundreds of thousands of hectares of coral that's demolished by perfectly natural uh, causes. And incidentally, the incidence of severe cyclones in the last century has been much less than in the previous century. Now here's one of these flood plumes coming out of the... Uh, yeah, Princess Charlotte. Now, those rivers that it's coming out of, there's virtually no uh, agriculture. There's a little bit in uh, Lakeland Downs, and there's very little cattle running there. That's a perfectly natural runoff from a natural drainage that's undeveloped, and you see it extends right out over the reef. But as I say, it's also just a surface flow. This is... Uh, the, you know, they were talking about the, uh, the terrible effects of CO2 on reefs. Well, if we look up there around Papua New Guinea, and we go over there to these islands off the eastern end, uh, these are some of the islands, and there's a couple of places there where there are volcanic hot springs coming up in the ocean on reefs, and that's CO2, and one of those hot springs just off the shore of an island. We go underwater there, and what do you have? incredibly lush thalassia grass being fertilized by the CO2. It loves it. Uh, and here's some of the coral on the reef adjacent. And those are bubbles of pure CO2, about 25,000 times more concentrated than what is in the atmosphere. And it's bubbling up right along the sides of corals, and they're perfectly healthy. Some of the outer reefs. One of the things, you've seen a lot of pictures like this of the reefs. One of the things you notice, it's pretty typical, uh, there's not a boat in sight. Now, you don't need a supercomputer and a PhD to figure out if there's no boats, there's no fishing. Uh, it's beyond, it, it, it is actually criminal. We have laws against defamation, against fraud, against false advertising, all this, and they routinely do these things which are provably false. One example, is uh, a, few, a couple of years ago they published a study purporting that the green zones had double the number of coral trout on the protected reefs. When you look in the actual study itself, this was done as a, a it created a press release and then the media all picked up on it, but when you go to the actual study itself, you find that they looked at seven different reef areas and in one of them, the coral trout number doubled. In one of them, it halved. And in five of them, there was very little difference. Uh, and this kind of fluctuation is perfectly natural. From season to season, reef to reef, year to year, fish numbers uh, uh, change. And so you take one item out of a group of seven, that, that, and the others are all conflicting what they say, and yet, they release it as a press release and it goes around the world. And it wasn't just an accident because I pointed it out to them and said you need to put a release out to correct this misperception and of course they didn't do it. Uh, now a another example is you've probably heard the claims over and over again about how valuable our tourism industry is to the reef, uh, the reef tourism industry is and so why we need to protect it and it's so much more important than commercial fishing. Well. They claim a value of some four and a half billion dollars or something for tourism. That's the total expenditure for all tourism in the region. Well, half of the tourists don't even go to the reef. Of the half who do, 95% or more of them, they, their ex reef experience is a one day, one time trip on one of the reef uh, trips. Now, those bring in a total of about $130 million a year, the last figure I saw. It's almost the same as the dockside value of the uh, commercial fishing catch. But that's the dockside, the wholesale value. 
because the fishermen then sell it to the uh, fish shops and then they on sell it to the restaurants and things. Most people here spend more, most visitors spend more on seafood and restaurants than they do on traveling to the reef. And not only that, the whole reef tourism industry only uses about two dozen reefs out of the two and a half thousand that comprise the barrier reef. Uh, and even on those reefs, they only use a tiny fraction of the reef. So there's no reason whatsoever that you couldn't have every tourist reef totally protected and still have 99% of the barrier reef left open to fishing. Incidentally, uh, I have a web page uh, and a Facebook page, but the web page has got links to dozens and dozens of the articles and things that I've written on these matters. If you're interested in it, uh, just Google Walter Stark and you'll find uh, a reference to my website. It's called www.goldendolphin.com. So if you look there, then you'll get a whole list of these articles and things, and uh, you can uh, have a look at uh, more detail on a lot of this stuff.